and I will post it on YouTube along with the other lectures. Uh, OK, and I will also maybe take the time until six o'clock because we lost uh, some time uh, now. So, uh, so, so since we start later, uh, we will not uh, uh, finish as usual. So hope you're OK with that. Um, OK, great. So let me start the presentation. So as I mentioned last time, today we're going to discuss about transformers and the main component of uh, these uh, new neural network models uh, is the multi-head self-attention. So we're going to introduce um, uh, this type of uh, block or layer, whatever you want to call it. And uh, then we will also see um, other uh, components of the transformers. And we will discuss uh, mainly about language transformers because first um, these models were introduced in natural language processing. But we will also um, see um, some examples of uh, such models from uh, vision. OK, so uh, in the previous two lectures, we discussed about um, word embeddings, right? And we will continue this discussion with some newer model, but only briefly, that actually also uh, paved the way towards uh, building transformer models, or at least they used some of the principles that are now used in, uh, in transformers. OK, so for today we're going to discuss about these uh, briefly about these ELMOS and ULM feet, which are um, methods to obtain word embeddings, but are more complex than word to vec or uh, glove. Then we're going to discuss about transformers, the key component of transformers, which is the uh, self-attention uh, module, and then we will see uh, some examples from literature uh, of uh, different transformers from uh, NLP and vision. OK, so um, yeah, as, as I uh, as you've seen in the last uh, two lectures, uh, word embeddings were introduced in the 2013-2014 uh, and they became very popular, although uh, you saw last time that the uh, some of the performance improvements are mostly caused by the um, hyperparameters and uh, additional heuristics uh, added, uh, not the uh, training algorithm themselves. However, um, uh, people appreciated also the efficiency of these models. OK, they boosted the accuracy, but they um, were also more efficient than previous uh, methods. But word to vec and Glove are based on shallow representations. So if you remember in word to vec you had the CBAO and the SkipGram model, and they're both based on just two uh, layers of uh, neural networks. So they are not uh, very, let's say, deep models. They are uh, shallow approaches. And um, however, they were integrated in deep models. So you would add this, uh, I don't know, uh, embedding layer in your network, and then you could use, uh, I don't know, convolutions or uh, recurrent uh, layers to uh, learn, um, uh, let's say, high, uh, higher uh, order uh, features on those uh, word embeddings. So you can integrate these models or you can pre-train them and use um, deep, uh, deep models on top of uh, these um, um, word embeddings. OK, so uh, yeah, as I said, the rest of the model would be trained just on the specific task, which uh, can be trained with uh, less data. So this is the one of the, the principal um, is this uh, concept of pre-training that is also used in uh, transformers, but it, it, it becomes more evident with uh, ELMO and ULM feed where they train these models. Um, they use pre-training of the entire model. OK, so uh, the question or maybe the problem with word to vec is glove is that they only use this first layer that is pre-trained, the embedding layer, and um, uh, later people suggested or tried to uh, pre-train more layers and thus be able to 
extract more uh, complex rules from uh, from such models. So the um, yeah, one of the works that introduced this idea is uh, ELMO, which is short for embeddings from language models. So the idea is that uh, here they, they used uh, bidirectional stacked LSTMs. So bidirectional means that the LSTMs work uh, in, in both direction and they have multiple layers with this type of approach and each layer provides uh, a word embedding, let's say. So these are um, a hierarchy or hierarchy of word embeddings and um, then they use the, the the final embeddings is just a combination of the word embeddings from these different layers. So this is the uh, Elmo uh, embedding and then it can be used in a similar way on down, downstream task in a similar way as uh, word to vec or Glove. It's just that this approach uses um, pre-training on uh, uh, of a larger model that this is actually a deep model, right? Compared to word to vec and Glove, uh, this type of architecture is actually deep. Okay, so uh, they showed um, improvements on a, a range of tasks from question answering, um, textual entailment and so on. So uh, in this is a table from their paper and they have the previous uh, state of the art results and the new uh, results obtained with uh, a elbow. And they show uh, improvements on each of these uh, tasks. So um, if you look uh, in more detail these tasks, so in question answering on the squad data set, um, the, the questions are about uh, words. So you have a paragraph of text like uh, this one and you have some questions and the answer you will find it somewhere in the text. So it's a, a phrase from the text, a, I don't know, a sequence of words or something that you can find it exactly in the text. So these are questions, for example, related to this text and you find here the answer for the first question, the answer for the second one and so on. So there are about um, uh, 100,000 question pairs and uh, Answers always span um, uh, are spans in the question or uh, phrases of words in the question. The second task, uh, textual entailment um, related to textual entailment, the uh, SNLI corpus. Um, they had to um, um, determine relations between sentences, such as this one, which is about contradiction. So. Um, here we have a man inspects the uniform of a figure in some East Asian country and the man, is, uh, the man is sleeping. So it can do both things at the same time, so this is contradiction. And um, so on. Okay, so uh, intel, the entailment relation is like a, um, I don't know, rephrasing of the same uh, concept. So a soccer game with multiple males playing and some men are playing sport. This expresses the, the same uh, concept. So this is the entailment relationship. OK, and other uh, tasks are so they also apply this on uh, the glue benchmark, which was constructed as a, a benchmark for natural language understanding, where uh, people can now evaluate uh, complex NLP models on a broad set of tasks and uh, the task included in uh, glue are to uh, detect the uh, correctness of a sentence, the sentiment positive or negative, to um, determine if um, a phrase B is a paraphrase of uh, sentence, uh, sorry, uh, if yeah, sentence uh, B is a paraphrase of sentence A and um, so on. So the different tasks and uh, Elmo at the time showed the uh, state of the art results on, on all these uh, tasks. OK, so now we have also the task to determine the similarity of two sentences. If two sentences are a uh, contradiction, if the sentence B contains an answer to the question in uh, sentence A, um, the entailment relationship and, and so on. So in total in GLUE there are nine tasks. And the models are uh, scored on the average across all these different tasks. So the model is supposed to do uh, to, to solve all these tasks together and
and the we compute the average score and that's the final score of that that model okay in uh, ulm fit it, it, it was um, uh, introduced by uh, a team from fast ai so again it uses the same principle of um, building a, a model, a language model that is pre-trained on a general domain, like a large corpus, and then um, it is fine-tuned on a target task, and then uh, we, we obtain a classifier for the target task, and then we, we use that model in the end. So it's based on a similar um, architecture, so it's uh, to, to Elmo, like uh, uh, some layers of uh, LSTMs, um, they extract embeddings at the end, so the embeddings are still uh, extracted from a deep uh, architecture. And uh, these are uh, so pre-trained on a general domain, then the whole model is fine-tuned on a specific domain, and then they uh, use these embeddings in a target classifier and uh, obtain the, the weights from, from uh, this model there. Okay, so... Um, uh, people refer to this moment when, so around 2017-2018, to the NLP ImageNet moment, uh, because um, these models, ELMO and ULM feed, uh, started to uh, obtain state-of-the-art results across a broad uh, range of tasks. And um, it also borrowed the, the principle that people uh, used on ImageNet. So, um, Maybe you, uh, in, you remember in lecture four, we mentioned about the, this um, transfer learning paradigm where people trained um, uh, convolutional neural networks on ImageNet, and then they used those uh, models, pre-trained models on different tasks and uh, obtained state-of-the-art results, um, even if they had uh, only a few hundred examples for the uh, downstream tasks. So it's really, uh, it was a really uh, important moment from the NLP because this kind of paved the way for uh, future research and showed that this is the, the way to go. So now all these um, newer models that obtain state-of-the-art results in NLP are based on pre-training uh, the model on large, very large uh, corpora and uh, then fine-tuning the model on uh, specific tasks to obtain. Uh, state-of-the-art results. Okay, so uh, the, the models that follow this uh, training paradigm with transfer learning um, uh, are, for example, BERT is very popular, which uh, comes from bidirectional encoder representations from transformers, or NHNet, which also is a transformer based on multi-sequence uh, the sequence model, um, and, and so on. So, um, uh, as you saw in the, in the previous slide, actually, this, uh, there is the, the, this common uh, word that appears is transformers. So, um, this is um, a, a new model that is based on, uh, on attention. And uh, yeah, it is called a transformer model because it essentially uh, transforms the uh, input to a different output. So, it was initially applied on... Uh, uh, sequence to sequence modeling or uh, translation, text translation. Okay, so um, we will now discuss about uh, transformers. So the first uh, paper that introduces this type of architecture is uh, called Attention is All You Need. And the uh, what this paper did essentially was to use, uh, so, so people, uh, we, when we discussed about um, LSTMs and recurrent networks. Maybe you remember that um, some of the sequence-to-sequence -sequence models based on RNN um, used attention to obtain better results. So they introduced attention on top of the RNN to improve results. And then these guys in 2017 uh, that uh, proposed this paper, attention is all you need, they actually removed the uh, recurrent layers and used only the uh, attention layers uh, or only the attention module to uh, to uh, obtain uh, state-of-the-art results. So essentially they use this type of uh, encoder-decoder architecture that is depicted here on the 
right side. So um, we were going to delve into the details of the encoder, which has kind of the same components or architecture as the uh, uh, as the decoder here. So um, yeah, it's, it is based on, the, so both the encoder and the decoder are based on just uh, attention and feed forward layers. So um, the, the, the main focus now is to uh, understand this uh, multi-head uh, attention module so that you can uh, understand uh, this, uh, this architecture. Okay, so the basic idea is just to use fully connected layers and attention and uh, remove uh, recurrent or convolutional layers uh, in case of uh, computer vision. Uh, uh, the, the same principles apply, but um, you can uh, remove convolution and replace this with, uh, with attention. So uh, this paper attracted a lot of uh, attention actually because um, it sets new state-of-the-art results on neural machine translation. So uh, they, they show that um, this type of uh, architecture produces um, state-of-the-art results. So as I mentioned earlier, we will just uh, focus on the uh, encoder part uh, and we will try to look at this type of architecture and uh, explain uh, all the components. Okay, so um, just uh, bear in mind that we will also discuss about BERT and actually uh, some other models are just uh, based on the encoder part. So like GPT-2 is also just the encoder. So there are a lot of models that just use the, the encoder. Um, okay, but in, in this paper, since they are dealing with machine translation, they also have the, so in machine translation, you have an input sentence, an output sentence, and you want to translate the input sentence to, to the output sentence. So, uh, okay, going back to this slide. So the main components of this encoder are the masked self-attention, where uh, we see it uh, here. So it's multi-head, uh, actually, self-attention. Uh, the positional encoding and the uh, layer normalization, and of course, the feed-forward layers, which will not going to be uh, discussed today because uh, you already know uh, what they mean. Okay, so uh, let's look first at the multi-head self-attention layer. So uh, in the basic self-attention, we have uh, the input, like a sequence of uh, tensors. This could be, for example, a sequence of, um, I don't know, pre-trained word embeddings, or uh, uh, they can be also one hot vectors, whatever. So we have this sequence of uh, tensors. They, in, in the original paper, this represented the input sentence. And you also have uh, the output, which is also a sequence of, of tensors. And um, each output is obtained as a weighted sum of the input sen uh, sequence. So essentially, um, the, the attention, so for example, when you do machine translation, each word in the input should correspond to one word in the output. It might not be, so the first word might be translated to the third word in the translation, in the translated sentence. So you need this uh, weighted sum to know which uh, word to, to look at when you translate the, the sentence. Okay, so essentially the output uh, uh, yi is based on the uh, sum, the, the weighted sum uh, of each uh, input tensor uh, xi with some uh, weight uh, vector of i and j. And for the moment, let's just assume that this weight vector is not uh, a learned weight, it's just a function um, of xi and xj. And um, yeah, this is actually obtained by the uh, dot product of these, uh, uh, of these two vectors. Sorry, I just need to remove this here. Um, Okay. Okay. So, um, yeah. So um, another operation that is uh, done here uh, is to uh, make sure that these. So this, since this is a weighted sum, 
it needs to the weights need to sum up to one. So what operation we add here is the softmax operation. You maybe you recognize this equation from the previous lectures. This is the softmax. So each weight is divided by the sum of the uh, exponentiated uh, weights, all the other exponentiated weights. OK, so this is the, the softmax operation, and this is how we obtain this weight. OK, so in, in principle, uh, for example, if we want to output the second uh, word here from the output tensor, um, we, um, we compute this weighted sum with respect to uh, the uh, uh, input X2. So we have the weighted sum with respect to X2 with uh, all the other inputs. Um, we uh, multiply these weights with the actual uh, input tensors, and this is how we obtain the output tensor for this component. We will go into explain this operation in more detail later once we also introduce the learned weights. So, so far we have the basic self-attention without the learned weights and the um, so, so uh, an, another um, actually another observation here is that with these uh, operations the order of the tensor does the the output right so um, uh, later we will if we want to uh, know the order of words, we will have to uh, add some additional components in order to, to fix this problem. OK, so uh, so far uh, we need to learn weights in order to actually uh, build something useful from this and to uh, obtain some uh, interpretation of the um, of these uh, operations. So actually for each input uh, vector xi, um, we actually have, uh, we, we use it right in three ways. So actually it, it is used as the input here, xi, and this, it is also used, uh, they are also used, the inputs are also used here in these, uh, to obtain this uh, weighted sum, uh, weights for the uh, input, right? So actually, uh, these represent, these are interpreted as, uh, so each use of xi is interpreted in a different way. So uh, it plays the role of keys, uh, queries and values. And actually to make sure that we uh, have these roles, we need to introduce or to multiply that, that, that input with some weights. So uh, first we have the, um, we compare x uh, i to every other vector to compute the attention weights for its uh, own output uh, y i. So this is the query, right? This uh, with a uh, circle with red. Um, then we blue with blue we have the key. So for the second, uh, if we want to uh, obtain the output for the second input x two. Uh, we have the key X2, so here it is used as a key, and the key, uh, so it is compared to uh, uh, every other vector to compute the uh, attention um, W uh, prime of i and j. And then this is uh, summed up with the vectors to form the final result. Uh, so this is the final weighted sum, like the output of the self-attention. So um, this, uh, this is uh, seen as a value. So the, you can interpret the whole process as uh, retrieving values from a hash table for a, from a dictionary, right? Where you have keys and values. And um, when you got a token, uh, you uh, take the corresponding query you look up the query in your dictionary, you find the uh, keys that return a certain value, and, and that's how you compute the, the output. OK, so in order to have or to fulfill three different roles for X, 
Um, we need uh, actually to, to multiply X with some uh, weights. And actually here we use some weight matrices. So actually we have weights for each, um, um, for each position in the input sentence. So um, this is W, Q is a weight matrix and uh, the queries, keys and values are actually obtained by multiplying the input X, I with these uh, weight matrices. And so these are three different weight matrices. They are not, they don't have, they have different components, right? They, they have different weights. And uh, the goal is to make sure that the input X fulfills these three uh, roles. So this is how we introduce the learned weights into the self-attention. Then the uh, weighted sum is computed as the uh, queries times the keys. So this performs the lookup in our dictionary. Um, we need to uh, again normalize the weights using soft, the softmax operation. And finally, the output is computed as these uh, weights times the uh, input X, uh, J. Um, OK, so actually uh, here, sorry, it should be. Um, and this is VJ. OK. Okay, great. So, um, yeah, so um, looking, for example, in uh, uh, how uh, the self attention can replace a recurrent uh, model. So, we can replace, for example, the uh, LSTM, the directional LSTM rails with this self attention mechanism. So, essentially, we have uh, a set of input tokens and a set of output tokens that we need to produce through self attention. And this uh, is um, essentially obtained. So each BI, each token here from the output is based on the whole input sequence. So it, uh, it reads the whole input sequence at once in order to produce each uh, output. And um, these can be computed in, uh, in parallel. So actually, um, all the, the the entire output can be computed through uh, through matrix operations. So the equations that we saw in the previous slide can actually be done with matrix multiplications. So we can obtain the entire uh, output at once. And this is also um, efficient from a computational per perspective because the whole um, operation can be done on uh, on GPU. OK, so um, let's go on to the next slide. So now we look at this uh, self-attention mechanism. So from the input, uh, we extract first these uh, uh, word embeddings. Uh, so first, um, I don't know, we can have an embedding layer uh, that learns some word embeddings with um, uh, some weight matrix W. And then from these, we produce the uh, queries, keys, and values. So for each uh, input XI, we produce a query, uh, a corresponding query, key, and value. So for each of the inputs, we have these um, three components. So the queries are obtained based on the uh, equations that we seen before. So for each, we have these uh, set of weights that we learn. And um, now each query has to pay attention to uh, each uh, key in the input. So uh, the, the weights that were uh, uh, denoted by W before uh, here are denoted by lambda. So um, we learn actually build. So this is the weight. Uh, so, so it's the product of Q and uh, K. Right, so then we have the uh, product of this Q and the next key and so on. So we actually multiply this query with all the keys. We obtain these um, 
weight vector. So these are just uh, scalar values. Uh, so the whole uh, uh, vector can be obtained through or written through this uh, operation. And actually this dot product is also scaled with respect to the size of the uh, queries or keys. So this D represents the dimension of these vectors. Um, and so you can still hear me. I got a notification that I have poor network quality. Is it all yes. okay? We, yes, okay. we can hear you. Okay, great. So, um, uh, yeah, so so um, this is done actually to make sure that these uh, values, uh, so if they have very high values, um, they can dominate some some components can dominate the weighted sum so to make sure that these are um, like um, the, the values in the weighted sum are closer to each other or there is there isn't one value that dominates the sum um, it it is a common practice to to divide this by the square root of the size of the of these embeddings Okay, so essentially this is the dot product and this is the, the scaling factor. And on top of these, so these are the row weights, on top of them we use the soft max, which just divides the, the weights by the sum of all the other weights. So these are the, uh, let's say, the normalized uh, weights. Yeah, and, and these are uh, then multiplied, so the, the result, the, the weights are multiplied with the values, right? And for each uh, input, uh, we have a corresponding value, we multiply it with the corresponding uh, weight vector and obtain the uh, output for this position. So note that these uh, these uh, when we compute the output for the uh, first position actually from this operation uh, we have the sum of all the values and all these uh, weights so when we produce the first output token we take into consideration actually all the uh, input tokens through these operations um, okay so um, the same happens now to the next um for the next input we have the uh, query the second query q2 and this produces the weights uh, uh, alpha uh, from 2 1 2 2 and so on uh, these are all already passed through the softmax operation so then this is multiplied with the values just as before and uh, then we produce the second output token. And the process is the same uh, for uh, all the inputs, and this is how we produce the, um, the output of our self-attention layer. So all the tokens are produced in, in a similar way. So now we can actually uh, do these computations with matrix multiplications. So the uh, queries, uh, can be obtained by multiplying these with the uh, weights learned for the queries, with the weights that correspond to the queries. The keys can be computed in a similar manner and the values can be computed uh, in the same way. So actually here, uh, when we consider the output as a single, uh, sorry, the uh, input as this vector AI, right? We can, what we can do here, actually, we can concatenate these vectors into a matrix like this. So um, this means that when we do this operation here, we can obtain the first two, quiz, uh, two, two queries just from this matrix multiplication. So actually what we do is we take the, um, all the inputs, we multiply them with a WQ and we obtain uh, all the query vectors from one operation. So this is computed and only one um, through one matrix multiplication. Okay, so let's call this matrix I and this matrix Q. So the matrix of queries is called Q, right? 
So we can do the same thing for the keys. So we will have here the input matrix multiplied with the weight matrix WQ, and we obtain the matrix K that contains all the keys. The same is done for the values, just in a similar way. So it's just that we actually multiply here this input with different weight matrices and obtain the matrix of queries, keys and values. So all these can be obtained through matrix operations. And now for simplicity, if we ignore the, the scaling factor, uh, so uh, the, the weights, uh, as we explained before, uh, so the alpha one of one is computed by multiplying the first uh, query with the first uh, key. The second uh, weight is computed uh, by uh, multiplying these two vectors and uh, and so on. Um, and actually, if we put these keys, uh, if we organize the, the vectors uh, that represent the keys like this, so we take the uh, transpose of the matrix K and multiply it with Q1, we obtain this uh, uh, vector of, uh, of weights, alpha one of, uh, of one and yeah, with these components. And actually here, if we add all the other keys, uh, we can obtain the, the weights just in uh, in one shot. So in the end, um, if we multiply the transpose of the key matrix with the query matrix, we obtain this uh, matrix of uh, of weights. Then we apply soft max on top of this, and we obtain the um, let's say normalized version of this matrix. And with this matrix, we can multiply it with the matrix of values. And uh, so actually, when we multiply it with this first set of weights, we obtain the first output. When we multiply it with this set of weights, we obtain the second output and so on. So actually, uh, again, we can compute the whole output through this matrix operation, right? So. The whole process is actually based on matrix operations. So we have an input matrix, an output matrix, and these are uh, computed through uh, through these operations. So first we compute the matrices Q, K, and V through these matrix operations. We just multiply it with some weight matrices. Um, we obtain the um, weights um, from K transpose times Q. We uh, apply softmax, obtain a hat, and we multiply a hat with V and uh, obtain the final output. So this is basically the operations that are involved in self-attention. They are just based on some matrix multiplications. And the good thing about this is that they can all be executed efficiently on GPUs. So it means that transformers can be uh, efficiently trained on GPUs and they seem to be uh, quite fast uh, in terms of processing time. Well, maybe uh, the the operation is fast, but if the models are very very large, then uh, it's things start to become uh, slow again. Okay, so uh, this is the the self attention, but as you saw in that picture with the uh, attention is all you need with the encoder. We are using multi-head uh, attention. So what that is, is actually uh, instead of just learning one set of weights for each component, we are actually using, we are learning different set of weights. So for uh, the query, for example, one head learns W1 uh, and Q. The second head learns W2 Q and uh, sorry W two and Q and so on. So each head learns a different set of weights. So um, like you're, you're learning, um, let's say, multiple dictionaries in, in the same time. And um, this, uh, in the end, this is just implemented as a single matrix anyway. So you can concatenate all these matrices and uh, obtain the, the output just as before. So actually, you don't need to 
uh, do any um, loops to, to compute this. So if you have, for example, this multi-head self-attention, so in this example, we're just using two heads, which means that for each uh, uh, component of the output, we have uh, two uh, queries, two keys, and two values. So, um, and yeah, for another input AJ, we have uh, again these uh, two keys, two queries, and two values. When we compute the uh, weights and multiply it, so for example, the first key is multiplied with the first query, we obtain here the uh, weights alpha and multiply that after softmax with bi. We do the same thing here. So we obtain the first output bi of one. So actually, yeah, what I didn't mention before is that for each head, we obtain uh, a different output and the outputs are concatenated together. So this is the output b i of one and one comes from the uh, the head so for the second head again we have uh, the the weights that are learned uh, and after softmax we multiply them with the values uh, from that correspond to the second head so we obtain then the second output so these are concatenated and this represents the the final output of the multi-head self-attention layer Okay, so uh, again, this uh, uh, output, let's say, so after concatenation, we denote this, let's say, by the vector b of i. And actually, um, this can be uh, computed by stacking these two uh, vectors uh, together. Okay, so um, the first part in the transformer block is this uh, self-attention mechanism that we explained so far. So we still have to discuss about these other components. So again, here we have a bunch of uh, dense layers uh, that we're not going to discuss. Uh, so what is this layer norm? The layer normalization is just uh, uh, yeah, a way to uh, normalize the, the weights such that um, yeah, we keep the uh, uh, the different components like in the same range of values. So uh, normalization means we bring them to have zero mean and standard, uh, the standard deviation of one. So um, this uh, ensures a smooth uh, learning process. So it's just uh, an implementation uh, trick to make sure that we reset the weights to the desired um, uh, range. Okay, so it's used maybe for the same uh, reasons uh, we need to be careful with weight initialization and input data scaling and since we're using that softmax inside the self-attention layer um, it is important to use uh, this uh, layer normalization inside the transformer block okay so this to to avoid that uh, these values to to uh, explode, right? So it's just a hack to, to reset things to where we want. Okay, so um, it's it's a basic operation. It was also used in previous uh, uh, layers, in the, sorry, in previous architectures. Um, so in, in layer normalization, we're normalizing the, the weights. For example, in batch normalization, we're normalizing the um, uh, activation maps. So it's kind of something similar, but it's doing it on the weights. Okay, so um, so far about the transformer, um, we've seen that we have the self-attention that learns weights um, to build queries, keys, and values. We have multiple heads, and all the operations can be done through matrix multiplication. And um, yeah, the so far is this order of uh, sequence. So we've seen that this does not uh, affect the result of the computations. So um, this is a problem uh, in language processing and also in vision. We need to keep uh, the attention, the location of uh, 
the let's say visual tokens that we extract from images so this is usually done through positional encoding which means that uh, so in in the basic uh, self attention there is no position information um, and in the um, attention is all you need paper they use this positional vector uh, that is added to this um, uh, token embedding for the input. Okay, so this uh, this vector is actually computed with some uh, like a sinus of the um, time where the token, uh, so uh, let's say a, a function of i, right? And um, it appends this uh, to um, to the um, um, token embedding. Okay, so um, uh, we can also do this through one hot encoding. So the positional uh, the, the position of the words in the sequence can also be represented as a one hot encoding. Um, but uh, actually, um, in practice, if we don't know the length of, synth synth uh, of uh, the sequences, so this can be of variable length. So uh, then what we can do is to use this, uh, instead of one hot embeddings, we can use uh, dense positional embeddings. Okay, so if we concatenate this positional embedding to the uh, input xi and multiply this with the weight uh, metrics, we have um, the weight that corresponds to the input and the weight that corresponds to the positional embedding. And um, uh, these, these, uh, so these are just like adding so if you concatenate the two vectors and concatenate the corresponding matrices, it's just like uh, doing the um, operations, like first we do this operation and we sum with this um, other matrix multiplication. So, uh, sorry. Okay, so uh, these independent components obtain the uh, vectors AI and the vector EI and these are summed up together, okay? So uh, this sum is produced actually by concatenating the input xi with this positional encoding, and for simplicity we can assume that this, this is like a one-hot vector. Okay, so the actually the positional embeddings are actually based on this uh, sinus of the uh, time, so it produces this type of uh, positional uh, representations. Okay, so in the basic uh, transformer, we have the input sequence, we have the word embedding, we have a bunch of transformer blocks, and then we obtain the final output sequence. And when we add the positional embedding to the word embedding, uh, we can also recover actually the positions of words in the sentence. Okay, so it's just position embedding. It means that it just record the positions of words in, in the input. And um, now there is one more thing to, to, to take care of. So uh, what, what we've seen so far is that the transformer block processes the entire input at once and um, if we want, for example, to predict the next vector or let's say the next word in our uh, sequence, we actually need to mask the future. So um, in this type of, uh, to, to train the model in a self-supervised way through this uh, prediction of the next word, we actually need to, to mask the future. So the uh, attention weights are actually multiplied with this binary mask that actually at each moment in time uh, masks the, the future tokens. So when we have the input x1, we need to ma mask the uh, uh, inputs x2 to x6 uh, in this case. When we have the inputs x1 and x2, so when we go to the next token, 
and want to produce the second output, we need to mask the following input tokens and so on. So actually, this is this is done through uh, multiplying the row attention weights with this mask. Okay, so this uh, this trick was done in the sequence to sequence uh, modeling with uh, with attention. Um, in the attention is all you need uh, paper. Okay, so um, yeah, and they, they replaced these uh, uh, components, the recurrent components in the encoder in order to, to obtain uh, results. So next we're going to discuss about some um, other transformer-based architectures from language and vision. So uh, yeah, in the attention is all you need paper, um, they have these transformer blocks here, both in the encoder and also in the decoder, and uh, they output probabilities uh, for the uh, output words. And you also see here the positional embeddings that are added to the input and also to the output embeddings. Um, and these blocks are uh, repeated actually several times. Um, OK, so actually the encoder is actually formed of multiple transformer blocks uh, that are put one next after the other. Um, OK, so in, in this framework, they use both encoder and decoder, and they use the approach to do sequence to sequence translation. But in uh, later models such as BERT or GPT, uh, people uh, only use the encoder part. Um, there are also later models that actually use both the encoder and like the T5 model from, from Google. Okay, so in GPT uh, and GPT-2, these are model, models proposed by OpenAI, so which is a um, startup that um, wants to do, uh, to open source uh, state-of-the-art AI models, but actually when they build these GPT models, uh, they were afraid that the models were going to be used in a uh, harmful way because they could uh, really generate a really, um, um, really good text uh, that, that seemed very uh, realistic. So in, in this approach is just based on the uh, encoder part. So it learns to predict the next word in the sequence. It's similar to ELMO or ULM fit. It's just instead of using LSTMs as ELMO and UL, ULM fit, it uses transformers. And these are pre-trained on large scale data sets. Um, so if I think, yeah, they are trained like on 8 million web pages, something like that. And um, the the model is uh, is a generative model, so it tries to generate text, right? So it has an input uh, sequence and it tries to generate the uh, what follows after that uh, input. So when you use this type of model, you have to, for example, you can generate some text, you provide like a seed, like a few words, and then it starts to complete your sentence and text and so on. Um, OK, so um, at the moment, the, the, uh, the, they introduced GPT-3. So uh, and these two models, GPT and GPT-2, are publicly available at the moment. When they were initially introduced, they were not publicly available because they said that the models are too powerful for people to use whatever. So at the moment, GPT-3 is available only as a API. So you can uh, create an account on OpenAI and use or interact with GPT-3. You can not use it as a, a pre-trained uh, model at the moment. OK, so it's it's based on a, a conditioning on the preceding word, so it uses this masked self-attention, where it masks the future when it predicts the current token. And yeah, as I said before, it is trained on 8 million web pages. Um, 
the the model so there are different models of gpd uh, depending on their size there is a small medium large and extra large and this also depends on actually the number of um, uh, decoder blocks that are included in the architecture so um, as the models are deeper and deeper they also have more uh, parameters so for example the gpt2 extra large has about 1.5 billion parameters which is uh, which is quite large okay so um yeah if you go for example to to this web page you can actually uh, interact with natural language with this transformer model and see how we uh, how it behaves um so actually um, I'll show you some examples later with uh, GPT-3 that are actually more uh, impressive. Um, so, um, yeah, then, so after GPT, a um, uh, uh, team from Google introduced, is it Google? Introduced BERT, uh, which stands for Bidirectional Encoder Representations from Transformers. So the short for... Uh, uh, this. So what they do is do bidirectional encoding representation. So GPT and the, the previous models take the previous words and predict the next words. And in BERT, they um, predict like in, in both uh, directions. So in order to do this, uh, they have uh, only encoder blocks uh, and they actually uh, use this uh, masked, uh, they mask some tokens. So from the entire input sequence, um, they sample like 15% uh, of the tokens are replaced with this mask token and the model is supposed to uh, replace the mask with the corresponding word. And they also solved another task where they, um, uh, so just the, the models are pre-trained on large scale data sets. One task is to predict must words and the other is to predict whether uh, one sentence follows another or not. So if this sentence follows, so the, the, the model takes two sentences as input and it needs to predict if the two sentences are uh, one after the other or not. Okay, so the model is quite large. It has uh, uh, over 3 million parameters. It is formed of 24 transformer blocks. It uses an embedding uh, for the uh, tokens of 100, 1024. Actually, when I used pre-trained models, they had like 762 something like that or 782 components um, and they used 16 attention heads so again the architecture is um, the, the, the it is based on transformer blocks right and um, uh, so since birth so birth was introduced around 2018 on uh, archive the paper appeared on archive it was published at um, the North American chapter of the ACL in 2019. And um, yeah, since then uh, we had uh, other models that were introduced like, so first we had uh, GPT and we had GPT-2. And um, some of the later models are uh, now introduced by um, big companies like nvidia google and microsoft so the the number of parameters in this model uh, increased uh, exponentially in the in the uh, last few years and um, we can look a bit at this uh, t5 model from google for example so it performs text-to-text -text, uh, transfer it was introduced in the uh, first months of 2020 and um, it was trained on a very large corpora called uh, or corpus called C4. So this corpus is about 100 times larger than Wikipedia and the model has 11 
billion parameters, so it's quite large. And at the time, it obtained state-of-the-art results on these uh, NLP benchmarks such as Glue, Super Glue, which is a more challenging benchmark than Glue, and also uh, Squad. Okay, so um, yeah, these are some details about this uh, T5 model. And uh, so in terms of numbers of parameters, uh, it increased uh, quite a lot. So here we have the parameters in millions. So this has around, uh, as I said, 11 uh, billions parameters. Okay, so, um, so now in this graph here, so if we look at the later models, we have Google T5 here. So now the GPT-3 for, for, from OpenAI, it has, uh, in this scale, it has even more parameters. So it has, uh, okay, 100 and, so more than 170, uh, 5,000 million parameters, something like that. Or if we look, uh, if we think in billions, it is 175 billion parameters. So it's a quite large model. It takes, um, so it's not very clear. Uh, we know that um, it takes uh, several months to train on thousands of GPUs and the total cost for training is about uh, around one or three million dollars, something like that. So just to train one model, it costs uh, a lot of money. So um, only the, the big tech companies can train such models um, at the time. So um, yeah, the, the research in this direction is just, then this is, doesn't seem to stop. So uh, bigger and bigger models uh, seem to obtain larger and larger improvements. So uh, things are just going on this path, uh, this path at the moment. Okay, uh, as I mentioned, you can interact with this GPT-3 model on the OpenAI uh, platform. Um, the weights are not publicly available, but there is this uh, open source project from um, Eleuther AI. They uh, actually tried to replicate the results uh, from the GPT-3 paper, and they want to uh, produce, so it's called GPT-Neo, this is the name of the project, and they want to release the uh, equivalent of the GPT-3 um, for uh, public uh, use for, for research. Um, okay, so for example, I also try to play around with this uh, GPT-3 model, and it produces some, uh, uh, let's say, text that makes sense, but it's still, uh, so it's trained on a large data set and it doesn't, um, the, the text makes sense from, I don't know, from a language perspective, but it's not really, uh, I, I was really wanted to see if, uh, if I introduce maybe some um, uh, sentences about myself, if, if it's able to um, um, obtain or to reproduce uh, some of my achievements, and it actually produces uh, none of the things that it produced is true. So it mentions a lot of uh, achievements, but none of them are related to me. But yeah, it, it's a, it produces some fantasy text uh, that uh, reads very well. and it matches the context, so the description would look something like this, but only the facts that are presented here are uh, wrong. And there is also this uh, paper on this regard called, uh, I don't remember the entire title, but it's called uh, Language Models are uh, Stochastic Parrots, something like that. So they are just replicating, because they are trained on large corpora, they can replicate or generate text pretty well but they don't really understand what they are producing. Okay, and another problem with these uh, language models, although the text looks quite nice from a grammatical perspective, it also reproduces the bias uh, of, uh, of text uh, from humans. So it um, perpetuates things like, so it produces maybe sentences like, 
uh, I don't know, uh, use of money at least uh, most of the time or other uh, things that they read in uh, text produced by human. So this is maybe one area of research in this direction is to uh, eliminate this uh, unwanted biases in the text. And uh, yeah, as I observed with my interaction with GBD3 is also, uh, it, it's also uh, uh, summarized in this uh, uh, blog tweet by uh, Julian. Um, so GBD3 often performs like a clever student who hasn't done their reading, trying to bullshit their way uh, through an exam. So like just producing uh, well-known facts or half-truths that are not uh, or, or not entirely true, uh, but the text or the narrative looks quite well. So maybe it hopes to pass, this, to, to pass the, the exam. But anyway, the, the model was also used in other applications, uh, interesting applications uh, besides generating text. So for example, um, this is an, uh, an example where GPT-3 was used to uh, produce uh, web layouts from textual descriptions. So you just write down a large text that says, welcome to my newsletter and the blue button that says, uh, subscribe and from this text it produces this uh, HTML code and yeah you can change the color and so on uh, sorry uh, okay so I think yeah sorry I switched the slide I had a few more examples here um, yeah let's continue with this video Okay. Uh, okay, now we have a button for every color of the rainbow, so it produces this HTML and you also see the output HTML down here. So all this is produced with GPT-3. So it learns to produce uh, HTML from, uh, from text, which is quite nice. Um, Okay, sometimes it can also produce some syntax errors, but you can correct them manually. And uh, so it can also uh, introduce facts like these. And okay, I don't know, for some reason I'm pressing the pause by mistake. So we can create emojis. and so on yeah so let's go to the next so another interesting application is this um some some researchers um actually integrated gpt3 with excel so it takes an input for example some uh, cells with their values and then it learns to complete the the value for another cell. So here we have in this example with uh, states from the US, the population, and you put here a state, and GPT-3 uh, completes, uh, knows how to complete the, the corresponding uh, information. Now I'm not, as I said, as it produces half-truths, um, so it produces a value that uh, may be correct or not, I'm not sure. So. Um, it's not, um, I, I wouldn't bet that the, the values produced by GPT-3 are always correct, but um, yeah, it looks nice. Okay, it was also used for image generation. Um, so here we have examples of, uh, for example, uh, so generation from text, right? So we have the text prompt, an armchair in the shape of an avocado, and it produces uh, these uh, images, uh, a storefront that has the word open AI written on it, and it produces these uh, images. So the images look quite realistic, and these, of course, are not uh, seen in the training data set. So there is no store called open AI. Open AI is a company 
it has uh, yeah different logo so okay so uh, as i said there is no sign of slowing down so these are examples on downstream tasks where the model is so zero shot means that the model is just used as is without um, any training we have one shot uh, models so trained with only one example and um, models uh, trained with uh, a few examples so as you have or as you use larger and larger models it seems that you can obtain larger and larger accuracy improvements so at, at, at the moment there is no sign of slowing down with respect to how much you can increase the model to improve the, the results. Um, OK, and yeah, as I mentioned earlier, um, there is even a newer model from Google. It's called Google Switch Transformer, uh, which is even larger than GPT-3. So uh, things are still going on in the same direction. And as I mentioned earlier, um, if we look at the um, the ways things are trending only big companies uh, can train these uh, large models at the moment but um, there is also research uh, that tries to look at how to use uh, smaller transformer models and kind of take some of the uh, improvements uh, the accuracy or the performance gains that are brought by these models so one such example is called the still bird. So what this model, it's, it uses a transformer architecture and it tries to distill uh, the bird model into a smaller architecture. So distillation means that the, the smaller model is trained to reproduce the output of the larger model. And through this uh, distillation process, you, you can obtain a, an efficient model um, that performs quite fast. So it improves the, the inference time and uh, it retains about 97% of the BERT performance. So in general, it, it decreases by around 3%. So this is uh, maybe one um, direction of uh, future study. Um, so this is a very hot topic, active area of research. So um, there are always uh, perhaps new transformer models that are introduced. Uh, so you can check papers with code um, to, to see the latest developments. There are a lot of implementations of uh, open source models, pre-trained models um, on uh, different languages. We even have uh, two versions for Romanian, for example, introduced by um, researchers that I work with. Um, uh, in other projects. Um, I think uh, I, I would recommend the Hugging Face framework, at least for uh, language transformers. Um, they have um, um, implementations that are pretty easy to use and also to, to fine tune models. So you'll find these state of the art uh, transformers ranging from BERT, GPT-2, Roberta from Google, uh, Distal BERT and so on. You can find all of these in uh, in Hugging Face. So it's a really nice uh, library where you have this uh, zoo of transformer models. Okay, so now uh, we will discuss about uh, some examples of vision transformers, but only uh, briefly, I will take more time to to present the first uh, vision transformer called VIT and um, maybe have a few slides about uh, other uh, transformers in vision, including one transformer that was introduced by uh, our uh, our group. OK, so the uh, Envision transformers, actually, I think the, the vision transformer uh, was introduced uh, uh, early this year, um, but it was accepted as the, the paper, the corresponding paper for Vision Transformer was accepted at uh, iClear, which was um, uh, just uh, this month, I think. Okay, so the paper that introduces this is called 
an image is worth uh, 16 by 16 words, referring to the number of uh, tokens that are extracted from the image um, and that are provided as input to the uh, transformer block. OK, so um, the architecture is just a neural network um, that is designed for computer vision and category level recognition. And it was pre-trained on ImageNet and doing this uh, type of classification task on top, um, on top of the transformer. OK, so uh, it can be seen as an extension of convolutional neural networks with an arbitrary large receptive field. So the problem actually with um, the convolution uh, networks is that the receptive field of the CNN is strictly dependent on the size of the kernel. And uh, this means that, for example, the first layer, um, so usually if you use kernels of three by three, then the receptive field with uh, for one layer is quite small, but if you stack multiple layers together, you can uh, actually, if you project the receptive field to the initial layer, uh, you can increase the, the receptive field. But even so, the convolution operation performs uh, locally, so it just is, extracts local patterns, and the convolutional neural networks are not able to capture to capture the global structure of the image. So um, uh, the idea of using transformers that take the whole, uh, so as in language, you take all the tokens and produce the outputs at once. In the same manner, you look at the same uh, at the whole image uh, when you pass it through the self-attention mechanism. So you take the whole image and you process it all at once. So um, and you learn patterns uh, inside the image, like repetitive patterns to um, th th that have a global. Uh, so in, in this way, you can use the global information. So if you look at the whole image at once, you can uh, get a general picture of the whole image. Um, OK, so as in language, the attention is uh, a mechanism to uh, actually create arbitrarily long range dependencies through these learned weights between word tokens. And uh, so essentially when you translate, for example, uh, a sentence, one word can uh, attend to the whole input. And the idea in images, uh, we would like to do the same. So to find a way to translate um, this tool to images would be, uh, would mean that we can effectively replace the convolution with something that is able to, to capture the global structure. OK, so we can think of the self-attention mechanism as a tool to relate a pixel in an image to all pixels inside the same image. The problem would be that for each pixel, uh, so uh, now let's think at the pixel level, but uh, later we will see that if we actually use pixels, there are a lot of uh, correspondences to learn, maybe too many. So uh, instead of just using pixels, we can use uh, patches from images. OK, so in this case, uh, for each pixel i, we can create uh, a row vector q that's called the query, a row vector k that's called the key, and a row vector v that's called the value. And we suppose that they share the dimension, so they all have the dimension d. And we can now view the process of self-attention as question making, so um, pixel i uh, what is pixel I looking at and um, where it should uh, uh, direct its uh, attention. OK, and we can view for images the, the self-attention mechanism as uh, yeah, a way to, to build long range relationships between different pixels. So it's kind of the analogy where in language you learn uh, these relationships between words in a sentence. Uh, we can now also learn relationships between pixels in the same image. Um, OK, so um, we can formulate uh, as a, yeah, we already mentioned this, we can formulate 
this process through uh, self-attention. So, um, um, in in the standard dictionary learning, uh, this is based on uh, argmax. So we have uh, when we uh, make a query, we just retrieve only one value. But in the self-attention mechanism, here we use softmax. So one query can retrieve um, different keys. So this means that the attention of one pixel can span across um, a set of pixels. OK, so uh, VIT is based heavily on these language transformers. So it adds minimal changes to the language transformer to adapt it to the image domain. Um, the main uh, uh, maybe adaptation, the, the main uh, or, or the key contribution is to embed the input in a lower dimension to reduce the complexity. So if we would just naively apply, tra uh, apply transformers on input images, we will have a lot of pixels to deal with. So imagine in language, we just train the model on sentences like a few words and in uh, or even Paragraphs, OK, the input of BERT, for example, spends 512 tokens. So you cannot input a text that is longer than uh, 512 words. But in, in Vision, if we just do what we uh, proposed previously and take, for example, images of 200 by 200 pixels, it means that we have uh, 40,000 pixels in total to attend to. So it's a very uh, large dimension, so we need to embed the input in a lower uh, dimension. Um, OK, and another uh, another contribution is to uh, attach uh, uh, a learnable embedding called uh, class. And actually, this is also borrowed from uh, language models. So this token is used for the classification task. OK, so um, the the uh, the key idea is to embed the. Input as patches instead of pixels. So. Um, in the vid paper, they, they propose uh, essentially uh, the contribution is depicted here. So the image is divided into patches. These patches become the individual tokens that are passed uh, through some linear projection or uh, just simple flattening. Uh, some approaches uh, replace these patches with some. Um, so they, they use, for example, a ResNet or a different network to extract, uh, um, let's say convolutional features, high, uh, high order convolutional features. So they just pass the network uh, through some convolutions, uh, sorry, pass the image through some convolutions and they take the activation maps and uh, they take the, the vectors uh, from, uh, from this activation map uh, like the and that have so if the activation map is w times h times d the vectors will be one times one times d so these become the token embeddings that are passed through the model and since the convolutional the pre-trained convolutional neural network reduces the spatial dimension uh, from 224 to uh, I don't know, seven by seven or something like that. Uh, it reduces also the uh, the problem with uh, attending to too many tokens. Um, OK, so uh, in, in the original Vita architecture, they just use image patches for this. They divide the images into patches. So um, the, the patches, for example, have uh, the dimension P times P times C, where C is the number of channels. So then we have these uh, embeddings. We can linearize the patches, so obtain these uh, vectors that have um, 
uh, yeah, these numbers of uh, components. Okay, so um, we have the same problem with language models. Um, if we just use the, the basic transformer architecture, we will not know the position of, um, of patches inside the image. So providing as input this image or this image, we obtain kind of the same, uh, uh, same result. So uh, again, we have to add positional embeddings in order to uh, make sure that we know which is come from. So um, yeah, the, the positional embeddings are attached uh, as in language models are attached to each embedding. Um, these are uh, actually based uh, on a learnable matrix uh, denoted by EPOS in the in the paper. And the idea is just uh, then we just sum up the uh, the positional embeddings to the um, normal token embeddings. So um, the the final uh, embeddings are obtained by uh, summing up the token embeddings with the positional embeddings. OK, so um, if the CNNs are just a stack of convolutional layers, then uh, VIT is based on the same principle. It's just a stack of multi-head uh, self-attention layers. Um, so these self-attention layers just uh, embed uh, the input tokens into uh, different latent spaces of uh, token embeddings. So after several uh, operations, several transformer blocks, in the end, uh, we need to classify the images. So in the end, we have a classifier, a multi-layer uh, perceptron. Um, so uh, this is a fully connected layer, and it also uses the layer norm at the end. OK, so uh, this um, operates, the, the classifier operates just on the first component of the embedding. The first component, uh, as in BERT or other language models, is the uh, classification token, also known as the uh, uh, CLS token, short for class token. So um, again, this token, it's produced based on the whole uh, set of embeddings from the last layer. So um, we don't need the other tokens at the end to, to use this model for classification. OK, so um, in this layer, it, it essentially takes the token embedding and uses a fully connected layer where the number of components, the number of units is equal to the number of classes. And then we just add a softmax on top of that and produce the final classification results. Uh, the VIT is based on, as, the, uh, as we've seen with BERT or GPT and other models, we have architectures of different sizes that uh, use different um, number of transformer blocks or different number of heads and also the number of uh, units in the um, MLP layers uh, is also different. So we have this bit base, bit large and bit uh, huge. The number of parameters also differs between these models. The dimension of the embeddings is usually based on, so the hidden size, uh, D, this is the dimension of the embeddings. Um, and if we divide this by the number of heads, we obtain the, um, uh, the um, value for the uh, token, or the, sorry, the key embeddings and the query embeddings, which have the same size. Um, okay, so this is typically determined like that. And um, in the paper, we will also see uh, results in the tables with uh, different configurations. So L or B or H comes from the uh, this type of configuration. And then we also have the patch size that is uh, used. So 
uh, 16 means that it uses uh, 16 by uh, 16 patches. OK, uh, in the training they also use uh, dropout after the patch embedding, the projection layers or the multilayer perceptron. Uh, in the training methodology, it uses the same principles as the language transformer or the, or actually the transfer learning paradigm. So uh, there is a pre-training phase. Uh, so the model is trained, for example, on ImageNet and then fine tuning on downstream tasks. And um, now one, one training trick is that during pre-training, um, the classification head uses a two uh, layer MLP and when uh, when the model is used for fine tuning, they just use a one layer for the classification head. Uh, in terms of input resolution, they experimented with uh, images similar to previous CNN architectures, but they observed better results with uh, larger or higher higher resolution images. Um, okay. This is uh, actually a different uh, uh, model called Dino from the literature. This is a model that is trained in a self-supervised way. So here we have uh, two models, a teacher um, model and the student model, and the student model is trained to reproduce the teacher transformer. So both uh, these frameworks are transformers. Um, and the teacher is uh, an average of the, so it's called momentum distillation, this type of training. So the teacher is an average of the student in the last iterations. And since it uses this average or ensemble, uh, it produces better results. So then the student is distillated with respect to this average. And it is trained in an unsupervised way, so without any labels. And it's nice to see that the model uh, focuses on the interesting parts of the images. So these are attentions learned by uh, this framework, Dino, which was introduced in ICCB 2021, which took place in, in October. And if you go on their web page, you also, also see these videos where actually the attention in videos. Uh, so uh, yeah, you see here that it focuses on this uh, dog that's running around. But once the dog goes outside the scene, the model starts to attend to uh, whatever it finds in, in the image. OK, so um, another, uh, well, this has really low quality. Uh, not sure this should be okay. I was hoping to have this image at a higher quality, but never mind. So, um, in, in this framework, this is also introduced in 2021. It's based on a, a previous model called CVT, Convolutional Vision Transformer. Uh, so it essentially it um, uses convolutions to produce the token embeddings and these are trained through the framework um, and in this um, in this uh, transformer actually we trained it on medical images um, and replaced the uh, MLP layers with pointwise convolutions and so essentially it just uses convolutions and multi-head attention and of course the normalization layer and um, this reduces the number of parameters and the model can be trained more effectively but it still produces better results than uh, classic convolutional neural networks um, one problem with this type of transformer um, is if we have images with very high resolution um, then the uh, it, it requires a lot of computational power and in our case we were able to train this model only one GPU so here we had some convolutional layers that uh, uh, are meant to reduce the uh, the spatial dimension of the input images which are uh, 512 by 512 pixels so it's based on the CVT architecture and it 
the the novel part is to replace the uh, multi-layer perceptrons with uh, pointwise convolutions. So uh, this model uh, we compared it um, in this uh, cycle GAN architecture, where you take an input image and translate it to a different version of the same image, and we used it on medical images. Uh, where the inputs are uh, CT scans and taken uh, before and after introducing the contrast substance, which actually generates uh, different uh, images. When you introduce the contrast substance, uh, some uh, uh, tissues uh, get uh, emphasized, uh, so they, they get like uh, higher uh, readings in the Hounsfield units values. So um, we compared this with different architectures from the literature and obtained uh, better results. And we also employed this architecture uh, uh, in combination with another transformer for image alignment. So in image alignment, we have some, uh, for example, uh, a CT scan before the contrast substance and after introducing the contrast substance. And between these two times, the patient can move on the table or so he can breathe, I don't know, can change the position slightly. So then if you want to look at both the native, or the uh, first uh, scan and the second scan, they will not be perfectly aligned. So what you can do is to uh, apply some uh, framework to align this, uh, these methods. And the state of the art is based on this uh, VIT VNet architecture. And actually, when we introduce this, so the, the problem with the alignment is if the values in the house feed units are not identical, it is hard to align the images directly. So it gives you worse results. So if you first translate the images and then do the alignment, you can obtain some improvements. And here we show that if we combine with our transformer, uh, we get the, the, the best uh, results. And also, we, if you repeat this process for several times, so if you use a cascaded model, so you just do the alignment um, in one step and then take the output and pass it through the network again, you can further improve the results. So um, yeah, you can obtain quite good results with this type of processing. Okay, so um, yeah, I managed to finish in time. Um, maybe just stay like two or three minutes for questions. Um, and so I also have the, the next lecture, but I can still uh, actually I just forgot about the questions on Kahoot so let's try to do them now I don't want to buy anything start okay so classic mode okay so you can join the game um, you can see the game pin here, 8507366. And there will be only two questions. And in the meantime, you can also think of questions for the slides. So, okay, we should have like five I participants. I have a question but, uh, about the project. Uh, okay, let's first do the questions on Kahoot and then uh, we'll oh, okay. see the other questions, okay? Okay, so I hope the questions are uh, not too complicated, so. Okay, so yeah, for the transformer block used in language and in uh, most 
architectures, the components are the self-attention layer, the layer normalization and the MLP. That's the correct answer. So let's also go to the next question. Okay, to recover the positions of tokens, we need to use positional embeddings with transformers. Okay, that's correct. Okay, I'll check the report later. Uh, okay, questions. You had one question about the project. Uh, uh, is uh, ResNet uh, Inception at uh, ResNet and VGG considered uh, different models or the same because they use convolutions? um yeah so when i refer to different models you were supposed to use different architectures like uh, convolutional networks and um, recurrent networks are different models if you just change the architecture of the convolution and just train that network i, I don't think that's that can be considered as a different uh, model, okay? Unless you build the model by hand and show that you actually built the architecture yourself. So if we made uh, our own custom ResNet or DenseNet, uh, then it's uh, considered a different model? Yeah. Yeah, and, that should uh, be fine. Mm -hmm. And uh, if uh, we also made an autoencoder and try to later use uh, that uh, embedding for the pictures, is that considered a different model? Uh, yes. That would be it for my side. Thank you. Okay, great. You're welcome. Uh, are there other questions? Okay, let me stop the recording.